kind of this esoteric or almost religious belief. So I went off uh, to college and went to a place where I could look at a microscope because the college I was at didn't have a microscope and started looking at some of the things that were going on in the soil. The microscopes back then aren't what they were today, so there's still a lot of unanswered questions. I apologize, too. I had a PowerPoint, but it didn't make it here. So I had, this is where I start showing you some of the cool slides I have of nematodes and protozoa and bacteria mineralizing in the soil. So starting with that, so when I was at uh, Humboldt State University with my undergrad, I started working with hydroponics in the greenhouse there, and a lot of the technology was really focused on the lighting and the different things that were going on. But the lighting that we were using was 1,000-watt bulbs, and nobody in the horticulture industry in Europe where it was really emerging was using 1,000-watt bulbs. Really, it was all about 600. So a lot of the technology that was out there as far as plant response um, and what people were calling lumens at the time were still pretty un uh, uh, misunderstood as far as plant response Lumens, when uh, Anderson came up with metal halide salts in the late 60s, came up with this principle of lumens. Lumens really refers to the optic yellow, the 450 nanometer range where the human eye peaks out at because the, the technology that was being used was for textile factories so people could see the, the close-knit and, and thread counts in the textile factories. Plant growth was not really anywhere in the discussion that was going on. And it's funny, a lot of the bulbs that are out there marketed right now today uh, will talk a, a lot about plant growth and, and how good they are with plant growth, but really no science is really put into that. Just now is that science really coming into understanding and how the photon and par energy is responsible on the plant. So I got really into the, looking at that. And then we started looking at controller systems on how to mitigate water, how to more efficiently grow the right kind of plants. You have systems like NFT, you have systems like deep water culture, beta buckets, all these different things. And, of how you can grow your plants, but again, it, it, it really didn't control how the plant itself was growing and how healthy the plant was, and I got really into looking at how, what we can do on a soil level, on a conversion level to make a plant healthier and, and actually what makes a plant taste good to you and me. I started looking and traveling and working with clients in greenhouses and, and these amazingly beautiful greenhouses, great systems, super clean, healthy systems, but when you go to slice the tomato open, or you go to slice the cucumber open, it still didn't have that same taste when you walk through the farmer's market and you look at that really robust heirloom tomato that you find from the farmer there. So there's got to be a way we can do the two together and merge the two together. What is the key that's going to unlock that? So we started looking, I, so I started looking at what was going on in the soil and realizing that really soil is almost like a bank account for the plant. And just like you all would go to the bank and do business banking and you talk to the teller and say, hey, I need $500. I'd like to get 300 and hundreds. I'd like to get some 50s, some 10s, some fives, some ones, some quarters, nickels, dimes, pennies. And if you think of that currency denomination as mineral denomination for the plant, what the plant is doing is it's photosynthesizing. It's spending about 90, 95% of its energy creating these exudates that it push out of its roots in the forms of proteins, starches, and sugars. Much the same when you go to bake a cake, proteins in the eggs, starches in the flour, sugars, and so basically what the plant is doing is making these cakes and candies for the biology in the soil. And as time went on and technology goes on, we have now we have really nice microscopes, and what we can start to look at is what's going on with the response between the plant and those proteins and the bacteria in the soil, and there's actually a communication that's going on there in, a, in an electrical sense. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me take a little sip of water here. So much in the same way that you may want Japanese food one day, and you may want Italian food the next day, plants want a specific form of nitrogen one day and they may want a specific form of calcium the next day. So what they do with those exudates is they talk to the bacteria in the soil and say, hey, can you go out to the organic matter, the humus, and bring back this specific form of nitrogen, this specific form of calcium, whatever the plant may want at that specific time in its growth period. So in the soil, uh, looking at um, what's going on in the soil. The soil the bacteria goes out, mineralizes that, brings it back in a form. Protozoa swims around in the soil, eats up that bacteria, poops out another form of, of, uh, of available uh, mineral for the plant. But nematodes swim around in the soil. They consume those protozoa. They further poop out something more that's even more soluble for, the, for the, what the plant's looking for. And then you have all these other microarthropods, earthworms. And if, really, if you start looking at the soil, it's almost like this crazy bacchanalia that's taking place in the soil, and everybody's consuming everybody. And the end result is these available minerals for the plant to be able to do what it wants, or get exactly what it is that it wants. How can we convert that into a hydroponic system? How can we bring that into a, into a water system? Uh, what we need to do is we need to understand what the bacteria is. The species of bacteria that solubilizes silica is different from the species that solubilizes, that fixates nitrogen, that sequesters carbon, that solubilizes calcium. So what we need to do is we need to find out what that bacteria is and find out what the workforce is that we need to bring into our indoor system. So today, the, the, top, the title of this talk is How Big Data and the Ag Technology Revolution Will Impact Indoor Ag. What happens when a plant, when you, so we have all this great, um, 
soluble nitrates. We have really great fertilizers out there that give the plant exactly what it wants. But again, why does a plant not taste like that great farmer's market uh, tomato? And what happens with plants uptake nitrate-based aminos, they still have to convert it into a bacterial-based amino. And that takes tremendous energy for the plant to be able to do that. And thus, it's doing something, it's, it's lowering the energy of what I, what's called the BRICS density. And we talk about the BRICS density uh, a lot of times is sugar in the wine industry because it gives us an idea of what the wine grape uh, is going to, the alcohol content of the wine grape is going to be afterward on fermentation. But BRICS density actually tells us so much more of what's going on on the plant. It tells us our silica, it tells us our calcium, it tells us our trace minerals, and the higher the BRICS density, the healthier the plant's going to be. If you, and uh, if you're looking at brick density, another, another thing too is it's a great natural pest deterrent because what happens is bugs will fly around and they almost have not necessarily a heat seeking vision but they can look at what actually is going on as far as soluble carbohydrates in the plant. And the more uh, sugar is in a plant sap, bugs don't have livers, they can't complex that sugar, so they're going to always go for the lower brick dense plant. So focusing on that conversion of the uh, mineralization in the soil to the plant using biology versus conventional uh, fertilizers, you're going to have a, a healthier bricks dense plant. This is something that I think is kind of new to a lot of people every time I talk to clients. They are uh, a little bit taken back, so it's kind of a, a new concept, but I think this is something that uh, we're going to hear more and more in the future and trying to bring the two systems together between the soil and hydroponic systems. So we hear a lot of things about uh, biology coming out, mycorrhiza is something uh, that, that you can incorporate in your system. We have um, compost teas. I almost cringe to hear the word compost tea when people say that to me, because it kind of invokes this vision of a 55 gallon drum with someone sticking a bunch of manure in it and put it out in the hot sun. The thing you need to keep in mind is healthy soil has oxygen, it's aerobic. And when it drops below aerobic, uh, when, it, when you lose the oxygen, and, you, and it goes anaerobic, you begin to wake up these organisms that you don't want to see there, Phytophthora, uh, Pythium, um, all these different root-borne pathogens that are basically out there everywhere. They just need the right environment to take off. In a hydroponic system, it's obviously a water system, so injecting oxygen in there to maintain the aerobic biology is something that I became really curious about and how we could do that, looking at the specific species of the bacteria, the, of the workload of what we're trying to do, the, um, and how to incorporate those two things in there. I'm a little bit lost on my PowerPoint, I apologize. So if you think about a redwood forest, nobody's out there fertilizing a redwood forest. What you happen is you have all this diversity of plant life going on, dropping that forest litter duff into the soil. The, the fungi in the soil is decomposing that, turning it into organic matter, which is on route to becoming humus. You have the, this diversity of bacteria, because the amount of diversity you have above the soil is the amount of diversity you'll have below the soil to make, those, to make that available. In an indoor system, obviously you don't have that diversity. So what we're doing is we're looking at what crop it is that we're growing, what the needs of that crop is going to be, and then understanding the biology that's in that uh, would make that crop function, and then sequencing that somehow into a liquid extraction and introducing that into your indoor system. When you hear about compost teas, that's basically what you're trying to do. However, you need to have a diversity of biology, and the diversity is only, your, your, your liquid extractions are only going to be as diverse as the source materials that you're using. So uh, when I work with people in hydroponic systems and trying to introduce biology in there to back off some of the conventional NPKs and, and introduce some of the biology, uh, it's really important to look at the um, diversity of the source materials. Composts, using as many different kind of composts, earthworm castings, humus soils, food sources, so many things go in there to give you the, the, the diversity that you're actually looking for. So when I... So when I um, am working with people in, in large-scale things, uh, yesterday we were talking about on um, the panel crop selection, understanding what it is exactly that your crop needs. And so whether you're growing tomatoes, whether you're growing cucumbers, whether you're growing lettuce, the, 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 as important as choosing the system, as important as choosing the lighting is looking at your nutrient uh, delivery system and what is in your nutrient delivery system and how to do that uh, appropriately, I think. Right now, the easiest way to go, obviously, is using a lot of the really great fertilizers that are out there that are iron uh, chelate based and salt based, but I think moving forward uh, in the next little bit, a lot of the a lot of the technology is going to be moving from that conventional system to a more biological system and looking at the bricks density and how to raise that bricks density. Again, the higher the bricks density, the more sugars, the better that that product is going to taste. And at the end of the day, your your client is going to come back and say, "Wow, how are you able to do such a a great greenhouse tomato hydroponically or cucumber?" Would be looking um, is is what I'm trying to achieve here. So, a 
looking at the growing medias, looking at what kind of system you have, looking at um, what the crop is that you're going to do, and understanding all of those different keys and putting them all together in a way is going to give you what it is you're trying to do. Uh, bricks density, um, when I'm looking, I have a, a client that I was working with who runs a CSA, uh, hydroponic CSA. Uh, in Northern California, very successful. He's, you know, and I was, I was talking to him one day, I was like, wow, you know, you're really, uh, you gotta be so pleased. He's like, yeah, but for every three people we have that join our CSA, I have one person that quits. And I'm like, wow, you ever ask them why they, you know, obviously, you know, why do they quit? Are they unhappy with the service? Are they unhappy with the quality? He's like, no, they're, 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 they love the quality. The issue is they feel like they're wasting so much food. And I'm like, hmm, feel like they're wasting so much food. I'm like, how do, how do you, how do you come up with the boxes? He's like, well, we build our boxes off of what a typical family of four would eat from, you know, whatever Safeway or Albertsons or whatever the grocery store is. But when we put our boxes together, it seems like people have more leftover food. I'm like, well, have you guys ever, have you ever looked at the bricks density of the food that you're, that you're giving your customer? And he's like, no, I don't even know what the bricks density is. And so what happens is when you have a higher bricks density, you don't need to eat as much because your body's getting filled faster because it's got a higher nutritional value of what it is that you're, you're giving your client. And uh, he's like, well, I can't back down the, the amount of food that's in my box because then my customer says, well, I feel like I'm getting cheated. My box looks so small. So it's uh, looking at the bricks density and, and, and the food that we're growing conventionally, I think that this is going to become something that people are really going to start looking at as far as the nutritional value of the food and the efficiency of how it's being grown. Obviously, the higher the bricks you can grow in the crop, the, the more you're, you're, you're getting per square foot in your greenhouse or in your system, and uh, the more efficient your system is going to be running. Again, this is where I would start showing you some cool slides about nematodes consuming protozoa and protozoa consuming bacteria and getting back to that system. Working uh, with greenhouses, uh, what I do when they say, well, how can we integrate this into our system and make this uh, feasible for us? What I like to do is, is start with, you know, inter uh, introducing the composting, getting, trying harvesting some of the on-site carbon that they have, bringing that uh, into a successful compost, bring, uh, teaching them how to work with some of these liquid extractions, food sources that are going to use for them, the biology they're going to use for them, and then introducing that into the system, looking at the growing media that they're working with and the crop selection, Again, putting all these things together is uh, something I think that we're going to start hearing a lot more about as far as efficiency of indoor systems and the quality of the products being produced there. I um, also think, uh, I was uh, looking at the, the, talking about the redwood forest, um, in the Amazon rainforest you hear a lot about the terra preta soils and what the Amazonian uh, natives were doing with that. And you hear a lot about biochar nowadays. Biochar is actually not anything near what the terra preta soils is, but it's kind of like that in a sense. Because what was happening when they were creating the farming uh, spaces for them is they were slash and burning this really diverse biological ecosystem. And, that, and, that was, and it was basically all that biology was going to sleep and going into the carbon of the soil. And then they were putting over uh, basically fish guts and different things in the soil and that's excellent food source for the fungi and the bacteria in the soil and they didn't realize that at the time but it really made this just healthy fertile soil they were growing in. Right now today biochar uh, is kind of an unknown and there's a lot of misnomer and kind of mystery about it. How you make biochar and, and the success of making biochar is the source material, the, the pyrolysis technique that you're using to make it and then um, how you're incorporating that back into your soil. It's a great housing complex to put your bacteria back into your soil. It's a great mobile, it's a great stable um, uh, carrier or housing to put back into your media for an indoor farm. And again, a great way to keep injecting the biology back into your system. So I think moving forward, looking at, 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 at what we're looking at, big data coming out and mineral, mineral nutrition of the food and moving it into our system, I think that uh, the biology is really going to become something that is uh, something that people are really going to start talking a lot more about, especially now that we're able to understand it and uh, the research and the microscopy that's out there to understand it. That's where I'm at. Can I uh, answer any questions for anybody? No questions. That's a, that's a really good question, and I spend a lot of time actually looking at people's products, and I and I uh, connected with a couple of different schools who are doing that. 
There's a lot of snake oil out there, and unfortunately, I think that's why the biological approach here in North America has taken such a hit. Uh, you have these things like compost teas that are being sold for crazy amounts of money. You have these different uh, dried bacterial sources that are coming in. It looks cool on the label, but what really is in there? I did a study with a friend of the University of Wisconsin uh, looking at um, different inoculants for legumes, and so we inoculated 32 different uh, products that were out there, did a sequencing of the bacteria that was on there. Some of it was there to start with, some of it wasn't. We went back six weeks later and genetically sequenced the bacteria that was still there. Not one product had anything still living on the roots. So it's interesting. I think that um, how you introduce that to your system and the quality of the biology that you're putting in there uh, obviously has a lot to do with it. There's some great products out there. There's a lot of not so great products out there. I think the best thing to do, and really what I try and do with my customers, is help them harvest their on-site bacteria and their on-site source carbon sources. Again, going back to, uh, you know, you can take the, the plant material, the dead plant material out of your greenhouse. You can look at uh, getting um, manures or different source materials from around your local area, and that's all going to be native bacteria, native biology that you're going to be able to bring into the system. The quality of the biology in the bags out there I think is getting better. I think there's more efficacy that's going on, but I think a lot of the stuff that's out there is, is coming in from sources in China and different places that may or may not have exactly what it is that you're looking for, but there's... Uh, it's it's yeah it's a tough one because there's there, there's just so much there's so many choices out there and so much expensive stuff out there and you know it's it's obviously you want to you want to put your money where it's going to be best used but there's just really um, I hate I, mean, I, I hate to name companies of what's going on or good or, or bad but I think that this is just an emerging market and I think as people get to understand it more and more and there's more companies coming out that there's going to be a lot of there's a lot of good products out there but understanding and how to get them is talk to me after this and I'll tell you. Yes. Along those same lines, how do you test for the biology or the chemistry that you have? A lot of it you can actually do very simply by just kind of understanding it and getting a, a, a fairly simple microscope. The microscopes that are out there today for $400, $500 can give you so much window into what's going on. I also think that looking at uh, getting a refractometer and a plant sap pH meter and a microscope and using those three tools can really give you a great insight to what your functioning nutrient, uh, what your functioning nutrient cycling system is and your secondary metabolite bacteria that's available for you. Um, but you can, there's, there's, there's a lot of great sources out there. Uh, I'm available to give you some websites after this if you want to take a look. There are really great educational websites that can show you what the fungi is, what the bacteria is you're looking for, what the different nematodes are, whether they're root feeders or whether they're nutrient cycling nematodes. Um, but it's, it's, it sounds like it's a really heady thing, but it's amazing how, how just visually identifying what you have there will give you good insight to what it is that you're doing. Also looking at... Um, the plants have pH and the bricks. What I have a pair of um, vice grips that I welded, like a one inch by one inch piece of metal on both sides. And I'll basically just take some of the leaf material, I'll ball it up, I'll squeeze out a little bit of the uh, plant sap, look at it in the refractometer, maybe do a reading in the early morning, a reading in the midday, a reading in the evening, measuring my plant sap pH, and again looking at the biology that's in my system. It gives you really good insight into what's going on in your system. Does that answer your question? Yes. That would be great. We are trying to do that here, and actually it's a, it's a big topic at the NRCS and, and the USDA right now, and they're trying to figure out how to do that. It's, it, there isn't a really unified body that, that's, 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 that's doing that right now, and I wish there was, unfortunately, but there's, there's not. It's such a new emerging market here. In Europe uh, and in Asia, they've been looking at it for years. Here's a, a, a pretty new thing, and unfortunately, getting into a biological system, a lot of my customers, when I start talking to them and, and, and educating them what they're doing, they're like, wow, Malcolm, you're going to put yourself out of business here pretty soon because you're just telling me you got all your secrets. And I was like, well, fortunately, there's a lot of messed up soil and a lot of messed up growers out there, so I don't think I'm going to put myself out of business. But unfortunately, the, the universities and the, and, the, and the big systems that are, that are getting the funding to do the research aren't doing any funding really on this side of things because there just isn't, there just isn't the, 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 mo the monetized approach to what the end result is going to be. A lot, there's a lot more research going on with glyphosate and with pentamethyl and with um, iron chelates and, and different uh, salt-based uh, nutrients. But unfortunately, 
actually, fortunately, now we're seeing more and more data coming out, but it's such a new emerging market that uh, I think in the next five years, that's why I wanted to bring it up here, is uh, how we're seeing big, dag, big ag data moving us forward. Um, I think we are going to start seeing that, and I think in the next five years, I think we're going to start seeing a lot more efficacy coming out with this kind of stuff. Yes? Yes. You would want to look at what your growing media is. You want to look at, obviously, you're growing peppers. So you want to look at what your crop selection is. And then utilizing, um, I'm not saying take away your conventional NPKs, but looking at uh, silica and calcium. You know, we've been brought up in this, in this philosophy that, that N, it's all about NPKs. And if you look at the biosequencing of plants, it's really more about boron in the presence of boron with silica and calcium, and more importantly, bacterially digested silica, which is monosilicic acid, which is what you really need to transport nitrogen, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium. So looking, um, understanding that, that, that idea, and looking at your crop, looking at your growing media, and making some of these simple liquid extractions to supplement into your system is going to uh, help mitigate that stress of conversion of nitrate-based aminos and lowering that brick's density and bringing that biological-based amino into the plant so she, the plant doesn't have to spend that energy, and that'll bring your brick's density up. Yes? You have a lot of information. A lot of what? There is. I am so sorry. I normally have a, a PowerPoint. I'm kind of lost about the PowerPoint, and I have to admit, I was out a little bit late last night myself. So, <laughs> But I'm here all day, and I have lots of information. I have some great websites. I have a website myself that goes over a lot of this and has some great video slides and microscope slides that actually can show you the functioning system of what's going on with the bacteria swimming around being consumed by the protozoa. You can actually see the bacteria in the protozoa's stomach with a nematode that comes along and, and nabs up that and understanding that. But really, uh, in layman's terms, it's really just a poop loop, is what it is, because you have the bacteria eating the organic matter of the humus, the, the unavailable mineral in, in, in the organic matter in the humus, consuming that in its stomach, it gets it gets chelated in the stomach. The protozoa comes along and eats up that bacteria. The nematode eats up. So, and, and there's all these different releases along along the way. But um, yeah, there is. And if you grab me after it, I can give you a lot of websites. Yeah, there's there's tons of websites. I'm sorry if I'm if I'm doing it normally. I've, yeah, I apologize not having the PowerPoint because I think it would slow me down. So, yeah. That's a big topic too. The whole humid industry is. So, um, okay. So humic acid. Uh, is coming from a, a basically a fossilized carbon source. And the majority of the humic acids that are out there are coming from a product called leonardite. And leonardite is basically a, an oxidized coal. It's actually the perfect coal. If it had actually been kept under pressure, it would make the perfect diamond. But it's got an oxygen atta uh, molecule attached to it, so it won't, it won't create that diamond. It stays in its coal form. And what happens is you can take, and so it's basically thousands and thousands and thousands of years of decayed bacteria and bacteria poop is what uh, the leonardite is. To get humic acid, they're reacting that with, a, with an ingredient that, that, solu that um, puts all of those humates into, uh, into uh, liquid form, pulls them off of the, off of the um, I'm trying to think of the best word, dude. It, it pulls it off, reacting, it pulls those humates off of it and puts them in solution. Then the fulvate molecule is then further reacted with the humic acid and some more soluble molecule that comes off of the humic acid. Uh, fulvic acid, there's a lot of topic of whether or not it actually exists. For some people, they're not totally sold on the idea that it actually is there or actually is doing anything. Um, a lot of the humic acid products are out there, there's, there's you know, again, I'm, uh, there's good products and there's bad products, but I haven't really seen a fulvic acid that truly does what it says it's going to do. The humic uh, acid, uh, some people talk about using in liquid extractions as a food source. Uh, and, I, and I think humic acid and manures have a great place in all farming, but it definitely isn't something you want to put in your liquid uh, extractions because it's basically bacteria poop. Bacteria just want to use poop as much as anybody else wants to eat its own poop. So it's not something I would put in there. But the humic acid is a great way to uh, put carbon back in your soil and, and, and address that issue. Did it? <laughs> we'll get together. <laughs> Yes. Uh, 
that's a good question. Let me back up for a second. If you're a permaculturist, if you're a biodynamic farmer, or if you're trying to be organic, really what you're trying to do is shepherd this healthy aerobic microbial mass in your soil. When you grow 5,000 acres of corn, or if you grow 2,000 acres of soybeans, you have this monoculture and you lose that diversity of biology. And so that's where we kind of come in. You can put these really soluble nitrogens and, and phosphoruses back into your soil cheaply. I think that uh, we're going to start seeing in the future, obviously everyone here is, is, is realizing that those nitrogen and phosphorus costs are, are rising dramatically. Uh, phosphorus is going to become a resource that's going to become really difficult to get your hands on here shortly. So that I think that economic switch is already taking place and we're seeing it. If you can use a lot of the native biology and a lot of the native carbon sources you have on your property and convert that into something that you could put back into your system, obviously that's going to economically adjust what you're doing. Organics in the past have been so expensive because the manufacturing of them uh, have, has, has, has been an issue. Just the sheer fact that uh, the, the price point was, was getting what it was getting. I mean, I know what it takes to manufacture a gallon of high quality organic fertilizer. I know what it costs to manufacture a, a, a bottle of nitrate-based uh, fertilizer. And I think in the past it was cheap. But I think moving forward, especially in the next five, ten years, we're going to start to see those costs adjust and the uh, and the, the, the financials come more into play. Where it'll be, I think, if you can understand how to get a healthy functioning uh, biological system in your indoor garden, it's going to really drop costs considerably. I think phosphorus in the next five years is going to be a real issue. Can I confuse anybody else? Yes, Gene. 